Hello, I'm Sandy Rajgopal from the Hattie School of Governance. I'm a student here, and um, I want to thank you for your um, discussion so far. I recently read an article in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung that said, um, well, it characterized the elections um, in Europe as a whole, uh, especially in France and Italy in particular, as being a reflection of an attitude of the populace of those countries, showing indifference and almost, well, a nonchalance towards the, stabil the stability of Europe. Um, how would you think German politicians can continuously justify their expan expan um, expenditure on these countries when these countries and their populace are not showing an interest in the stability of Europe? Gerhard Schick. Well, first of all, um, at the moment, Germany is benefiting and not paying. We have to make sure uh, that everybody knows that. And uh, I think the basis for a discussion in Europe should be the economic truth. And it's interesting, when you ask Germans, they said, we help the Irish. And when the Irish, you ask the Irish, they say, they kicked us into bankruptcy, or pushed us into bankruptcy. Um, I think we have to make sure that we have a common basis, and that's why transparency is so important in the political uh, debate. And then I think um, the, once we have set up a currency union, our fate is interlinked, and we have to uh, tell it to people and make sure that we talk more about the social justice questions between different citizens than between different countries. I think there are Germans who earn a lot of, uh, learn, uh, who earn uh, low wages. And when they hear that with their money, a Russian investor in Cyprus is protected, who has billions, of course they say, wait a moment, that's not fair. And so I think Solving the social justice problems in Germany is the basis for being able to help others or have a solidarity um, uh, within Europe. Perhaps these remarks give you an idea uh, where my answer goes. I could talk uh, longer on that. I'm, I'm probably not one of the low-income guys you aspire, but I also think it's not fair. All right. But I think the first thing to, to remember is Never ever an economic or financial crisis comes without political costs. And what we see is now the political cost of the crisis. And it is very much related to Europe, unfortunately. So there's obviously a need to kind of refund Europe with new legitimacy. And this is a task for everybody. And if it is not delivered, the European project will fail, regardless of what now the German taxpayers looks at. I mean, if there is a growing sense of unfairness on both sides, the Southern Europeans thinking the Germans would overrule them, and the Germans thinking they have to deliver too much solidarity, then it won't work. So this is a very crucial moment in so far. And it is interlinked, I think, with a very general and kind of global uh, legitimacy crisis. Because what we will see in all mature economies and in all mature societies is a very low growth per capita. The Americans always hide it a bit because they have a growing population. But per capita, growth is very low. And we simply don't have the experience yet of well-functioning democracies with low growth. And, and maybe one more aspect, I think, uh, we're talking a lot about the, the cost of the German taxpayer and so on. The interesting thing is right now, I don't see the cost because it's not showing up in the, in the budget of the government. I think we've handed out guarantees far over 500 billion uh, euros and how much is showing up in the, in the Bundeshaushalt? I think zero at the moment because of all this uh, kind of financial accounting that we have at the government level. And I think once we really have the impact of the cost, I think it's, it will not be in the end 500 billion. 
but we will definitely see costs in excess of 100, 200 billion. And this will have an effect, and then we will have a debate. So far, I think we really don't have a debate uh, at the national level in, in Germany. And so, yes, we have handout guarantees, but it's not something that dominates our discussion because we don't see the effect right now. I have a question here. Thank you. Two reasons uh, for taking the microphone. The one is to make a great compliment to the school and, and ESMT because uh, I've seldom seen such a combination of uh, politicians, bankers, and scientists, or how, how you call them yourself, researchers. Uh, um, and and the, the way you discuss this is a unique form of, of a new interchange of, of uh, ideas or showing the way forward. And the second reason is uh, that Gerhard Schick is the one who is always asking the government the most nasty questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I, one question back Thank to you. you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have seen that there are structural problems with banks. We need new uh, uh, business models. And, and in Europe, it seems clear we need a new model for Europe, too, uh, to get to solutions. Now, the simple question is, uh, if economics are uh, more of a social science, and I think uh, we have seen this because you have talked about uh, uh, risk and surprise with Italy and some surprise with hyper real estate too, maybe, uh, where the accounting is already a little bit more clear uh, with the losses showing up. Uh, where do you see the greatest uh, political risk if you look from the side of banks? Where do you see the greatest challenges? And on the other side, to the politicians, where do you see the greatest challenges in re forming Basel III and, and all the four topics we talked about? Uh, where do you see the risk which, where something might go wrong? Let me start with Martin Blessing answering the first part of the question, political risk. Um, I think the biggest political risk is that what we discussed earlier, the actions of the central bank are not only buying time for politicians to act, but that they're, they're allowing politicians to not act. And we need further moves on the political side because what we have seen is that the construct of the euro was a monetary union, but a lacking part on fiscal and, and uh, um, political integration is creating too much tension and will not be stable. And I think that's the biggest risk. If, if, if I may, I, I agree with that statement. But it kind of slightly insinuates that go on politicians now finally act. And I think what, what makes the problem worse is that many politicians, even if they would want to, couldn't. Because there are already impairments to the political system. I mean, with the outcome of the Italian elections, what will you do? Uh, I mean, we had Mario Monti, who was praised from everybody probably here around, in his uh, wisdom in terms of what he was doing. But he didn't get any political support, any relevant political support. So the, I think the real question is, do we have political systems? By the way, not only in Europe, but also in Japan or in the US that are resilient enough uh, to, be, to allow politicians to efficiently act? Or are we in the midst of a at least risky situation that because people are disappointed, often even feel deceived, they vote for some kind of extremist views making the whole system dysfunctional and therefore losing the time, we are in short supply of anyway. So I, I very much agree with what Martin Blessing has said, but it's not just politicians who should be wise enough to act or courageous enough. It's very much also about whether we as societies have the capacity to develop our system so to make, give politicians the opportunity and the possibility to really act forcefully. Gotcha. I think um, that we see 
in Europe a kind of a negative feedback. There was not the courage to implement a European crisis management. For example, the, uh, Germany was against a stronger European banking authority. And now we need the political energy to make up for the mistakes and create a, a banking supervisor in, uh, in Europe. And Germany blocked any initiative um, of having a European banking resolution fund. And because of that, we now have to hand out guarantees to other countries because that is not yet in place. So the, the lack of courage in the first phase of that crisis now makes people be more disappointed and that blocks against more European decisions because people are disappointed with Europe. How do you want to establish new European decision-making procedures if people are, have the idea that, that Europe is doing a bad job? It's really a very complex uh, question, um, even uh, for a very pro-European uh, party like the Green Party, that often when, when we say, let's do that at the European level, people say, well, they're doing a bad job, because they can't. Yeah? And here I, I, I agree uh, with you. Um, I think in the political spectrum concerning banking regulation or financial market regulation, the complexity is uh, one of our enemies. I mean, to understand how the different rules interact um, is almost impossible. And uh, of course, some people now say, let's have an impact assessment. Well, first, uh, I would have been glad, uh, or we, we all would be glad if we had that uh, in the deregulation phase, um, would have spared us some billions. But uh, it's almost impossible. So you, you're designing a new banking sector uh, law by law, not knowing how the laws interact. I think this is a, a risk that we face. Other questions? Here in the front. Rolf Schnelle, uh, Hertie Foundation. Um, I'm, I have a question concerning Europe. We're talking about Europe, and I think I'm afraid I'm going to make things more complicated. We're talking about the Euro area with the Cent European Central Bank. And what about an area where finances are central, that is London? How do you account for working out the differences in approach? from that uh, traditional banking center and then with our specifics uh, on the continent? And how can we foresee these two sides coming together, not to talk about Europe getting together with the United <coughs> States and on so many issues that are important to solve before we can get to any uh, sort of sustainable solution? Let me ask Jan Hagen for a first <laughs> cut at that. Uh, well, Maybe, um, uh, first of all, I think that it, it's not only a challenge with London being a financial center uh, versus the other European uh, centers, uh, because finance is a global business. So we have New York, we have Singapore, and so on. And uh, that makes it always difficult uh, to deal with financial reg uh, regulation or um, legislation in, in one country or one zone. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to briefly come back to the point that you mentioned, what are the risks? And, and part of the problem, I think, that, that we have in Europe and also with banking is that we deal a lot with, cri with, with the immediate crisis and the challenges of a crisis. And I think we should take maybe sometimes a little bit a step back and, and look where we would like to head to. And, and uh, for example, with Europe, we did a very courageous step in building the euro. But I think before doing that, we should have ideally talked about what is the vision of Europe, where do we like to head? And um, I think implementing the euro actually implies we need much more integration on a European level. Unfortunately, this is not the vision that we have in national states. And this is part of the problem that we face right now. We have very different national policies. And I think in the past it worked very well because we had signals to the governments. For example, we had interest rate signals that forced governments to act in certain ways. In this crisis, for some reason, we decided that interest levels above 6% are unsustainable. I think this is this complete nonsense. Yeah? We had seen interest rate levels in, in countries before creating the euro of 10, 12, 14, 15% and countries could sustain with it. Obviously not with debt levels above 100, 150%. And the problem we are facing right now is we are seeing that countries behaved very differently because there were no regulations anymore in place. And we have 
the only way we, we can force governments is by intergovernment agreement. And this is a very different, difficult process to agree with it. And then we have the financial crisis. Again, I think we agree with all the financial integration. We need European supervision, but that needs agreement that we transfer national uh, authority. And this is something I think that lacks in the debate. We don't see that. And I think this is part of the problem. If we, and if we don't address that, my fear is that we, in the end, everything falls apart. Not a very nice scenario, but this is something I think is very real. And meanwhile, countries like Britain are talking about going in the opposite direction. Thomas Miro, London. Well, uh, this is one of the of the further downsides of the decision to um, to appoint the ECB as as a supervisory agency. Um, I, I don't think that it was a fair argument to say EBA did not uh, their job. They were attacked for their worst case scenarios uh, on the stress testing. But the worst case scenarios they really should have done would have implied to really account for uh, sovereign bonds. And all the European member states were, of course, shy to do this. Um, and EBA would have had the advantage that, that London would have been included. So, we will face a difficult situation anyway. I have no idea, to be very frank with you, how this whole debate on a UK referendum can be avoided. I don't see that a Labour Party in the UK will be able uh, to deny the possibility of a referendum if the Conservatives want it, because in the end you have to ask the people. And my experience from living in London the last four years is they are deeply anti-European in terms of anti-EU. So we will see how, how this will come out. It's a, it's a larger issue than just the banking issue. But with decisions like this one to focus on the ECB, uh, one doesn't make things easier, neither in financial terms, in terms of regulating the whole European market, nor in political terms, I'm afraid. Martin Blessing, would a Brexit level the playing field uh, <laughs> in a kind of a strange way? Um, I think for all the decisions that need to be taken, uh, British pragmatism at the table would be something very good for uh, the European decision-making process. Um, on the other hand, we know that the monetary union requires further steps in integrating other things within Europe. Since I do not believe that Britain will join the euro in the foreseeable future, we need to take steps to further integrate in the eurozone without uh, 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 the non-EU and, and uh, EU members probably, and, and that will create a problem because in the end, Thomas rightly said it. We have a problem that we have political bodies that can act for EU 27, but we have no political bodies that can take decisions for the Eurozone. And that will create, in the end, the biggest problem institutional-wise, I think, going forward, because if we would say that we transfer national sovereignty within the Eurozone to something, you need to transfer the sovereignty to some supranational institutions they do not exist, or if they exist, they are EU 27. And does it mean British and Polish members of parliament always leave when uh, the Eurozone issues are debated? And it's very difficult to understand how this will work, and it makes it very, very complex. Therefore, I'm a little bit lost to see the clear way forward in that, but I know that we need to reform the European institutions also for further European Euro institu uh, integration. And the only established Euro institution is the central bank, because that's the only field of policy where we basically transferred national sovereignty, i.e. the monetary policy we transferred. And, and if we want to transfer more, we need probably institutions for that group of uh, uh, countries. Gerhard Schick, I was thinking a moment ago that actually we've made the ECB into a kind of supranational technocratic government. We talk about the need for technocratic government because we can't agree politically. It takes us back to the outset of our discussion. Do you have a good solution for this two-track Europe? 
In two words. <laughs> no. Um, to be honest, to be honest, it's a very difficult um, question. Um, there is a. The Eurozone needs a governance structure that works. Otherwise, we will disappoint the citizens of the Eurozone uh, all the time because they feel the democratic gap. People in Spain say we're governed effectively from Berlin, and, but we cannot vote this government that is doing harm to our country out of, uh, of, the, out of the chancellery. Uh, there is a democratic gap, and they are right. So in order to protect European democracy, we have to find a way to make for democratically based decision making in the Eurozone. And then concerning uh, London, there is always the, the tendency that in distributional questions, people ignore basic economics um, and say, this is our income. We have that with rich people. They say, it's my income. It has been my achievement, which is complete nonsense because you cannot become rich in an extremely poor country where there's no law infrastructure, no public services. With the same intelligence, it's a lot easier to become rich in Germany than in Bangladesh. And the same way, if you are the financial center of a strong European economy, then you can earn a lot of money in London. If you are the financial center just for England, with the Scottish joining the European Union, you will not be a rich financial center. And I think we have to come to to a discussion that allows for talking about that distributional question that is linked to the existence of financial centers. A financial center has to allow for a redistribution of the wealth that is concentrated. And I tell that to the people in Frankfurt the same when they talk about Länder Finanzausgleich, the same way as I tell that to people in London. And I think then there can be a more rational debate on that. Uh, if in a very positive uh, scenario, the referendum would lead to a more rational debate in the United Kingdom. Sometimes referenda have this effect. Let's hope for that. I think we can take one more question if Anybody has one? Please raise your hand. Here we have one. Uh, yep. Yeah. Hi, I'm Devin Marco from the Hertie School. Just want to pick up a bit on that um, because the news is still hot about the um, cap on the bankers' bonuses. Do you think that's uh, a good policy or that's just a populist measure? Because I'm also thinking that um, Britain is really against it and they're mm -hmm. going to have a referendum and. U.S. doesn't seem to be going that direction, so it may be a, a risky move. So just want to know your take on it. Thanks. Martin Blessing gave us uh, his take, I think. So uh, Thomas Miron, do you have a thought well, on that? Well, as long as, as, as I lived in London, I, of course, always got the argument, well, we will lose our best bankers. Mm. But I have to say, what have these best bankers done these recent years? <laughs> so it's... Not terribly impressing, I have to say. Jan Hagen? Well, I think the, the other point is uh, we've seen losses created by bankers who didn't have big bonuses. I mean, I mentioned the Landesbank, for example, they didn't pay out large bonuses and we also didn't have problems. But uh, going forward, I think the move should rather be not to limit the absolute level or say it, it should not be uh, it should not be uh, uh, higher than the fixed um, um, bonus because then you come to uh, workarounds like how do you uh, evaluate cars and, and all that stuff. I think the main issue with the banks is really to bring back the connection between risk and reward. And I think so far we've seen only an asymmetry. As long as you make some money, you get a payout, but you never get punished if you lose money. And we often see that uh, there could be huge losses in financial institutions. And my personal wish would be that we would look at this 
point much closer, and this is something that's completely out of the political debate. So I think it's a nice move, but I don't see any value in it, and, and I think it's not really an issue that we should discuss. Gerhard Schink, I think you mentioned earlier your, but anything to I add? I agree with Martin Blessing. It should be, in the first place, a question of corporate governance, a decision done by shareholders, but they had lots of time and it didn't happen. So it's good now to make a law because apparently that does not work. The other way does not work. And as I said, you did address the issue. If you'd like to add anything to your earlier remarks, you're hereby invited. No. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Then with that simple answer, I think we will close this discussion. I say thank you very, very much to all of our participants for a very thought-provoking, a truly thought-provoking and wide-ranging discussion. I saw lots of seeds for future discussions here as well. I think we could have gone on on many of our subjects uh, at much greater length. So thank you also for your discipline. And many, many thanks to all of you for your attention and for your contributions. And very special thanks to the Hertie School and the European School of Management and Technology for making this possible. So warm applause for all of you. Thank you.